Uh, This morning, we're going to be wrapping up our mini-series, Go It Alone. Um, we've been here for the last few weeks. We've been on a journey of what it, looking at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What it means to live a life of discipleship. What it means to be in community. Whether it's something that you can indeed do alone. Uh, I have heard the argument that you can be a Christian without going to church. That you can, you can follow Jesus without having community. And while that may be possible technically, I don't know that it's the best way for us to live. I don't know that it's the way God designed for us to do it. I don't know that we have been called to go it alone. Are we meant to follow Jesus as individuals? Absolutely. We are meant to love Jesus with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I believe we're meant to do it in the context of community. So if we aren't meant to go it alone, what does it mean for us to do life together? And we've attempted to answer this question by focusing on three pointed statements. They are get connected, Be formed and reach out. Let me give you the Coles Notes version of where we've been over the last few weeks. Pastor Cody opened up our series and gave us a look at the first verses that were written about the early church in the book of Acts. In Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, which we're going to celebrate in just a couple of weeks on May 15th, the Holy Spirit was given to those who were gathered together in the upper room. Jesus had told them to go into the city and to pray and to wait until the Father had blessed them with this gift. And when the Holy Spirit came, there were people who were around outside who were wondering what was going on. They heard these men uh, praising God in, in each of their own languages. And so Peter sets out to explain what had happened, and he preaches this really powerful message, explains the gospel, explains who Jesus was and why he came to die. And 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people added to this fledgling little church of maybe 120 that were gathered in the upper room. And we get this brief snapshot right after that of what the church looked like in her infancy. What the, the first breaths of this new thing that God was creating on the earth, the church. And we're going to read the passage again this morning. It's found in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. And you've probably got it memorized if you've been here for the last three weeks. But it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So far for now. Cody introduced this little gem in our first week of this series. And we've spent the following weeks kind of looking at what it looked like for this early church to gather. And we pulled out those, those three points. The idea of getting connected, of being formed, and of reaching out. The second week we looked at some of those together type words that we find in the passage. How the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. But they also devoted themselves to fellowship. To breaking of bread. They had everything together. They met in their homes. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. Point number one was that they, they got connected. That they met together on a regular basis. And we looked at some of the other encouragements from scripture. Of how we're to one another each other. Things like love one another in John 13. Be devoted to one another in Romans 12. To honor one another. To live in harmony with one another. To not judge one another. Accept one another. Instruct or teach one another. Agree with one another. Serve one another. Be kind and compassionate with one another. Forgive each other. Encourage and build one another up and spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We talked about how we're so connected with technology and yet we're one of the loneliest societies in decades. That we crave relationship and connection. That we've been hardwired for it, even introverts like me. It seems to be clear that there is a, is a call to connection in Scripture. That we're called to be connected to God, but also connected with one another. That we're indeed called to do life together rather than go it alone. And so last week we looked at some of the formation type words. What did they do when they got together? What was the point of their gathering together? 
And it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that word devoted means that they immersed themselves in the lifestyle of living out these teachings. That they not only memorized what the teaching said, but they applied them into their lives and they chose to walk in a new way. They found themselves living out those teachings. They devoted themselves to prayer and to worship. They were formed in this new way of Jesus where they lived more and loved more like Jesus as they were formed into his likeness. So we talked about getting connected. We talked about being formed. And this week, we're going to look at how they reached out to other people. 3,000 were added on their first day, but the passage we read said the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Let's take another look at the passage really quick. It says that the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. But it says that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All eyes in Jerusalem were noticing this new thing that was happening with this church. That people were following after this one who had been crucified, who had died. I imagine they thought that they were going to scatter and it was all going to be over. The leader was gone. Uh, You've heard the phrase, if you chop off the head of a snake, you don't have to worry about it anymore. That they had rid the world of this sect, of this, um, this cult that had started following after Jesus. The religious leaders thought, if we can just get rid of the leader, we won't have anything to worry about. And now the leader is dead and gone. And yet, there are people still gathering in his name, and they're sharing possessions with one another, and there's miracles happening. And so people were noticing what was going on with this new church. It says the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They were caring for one another in ways that would have been uncommon in the society around them. It says that they broke bread in their homes, and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Can you imagine enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord adding daily to their number those who are being saved? They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. You see, they sacrificially cared for others. They were concerned with the physical well-being of those around them, and they likely sold some of their surplus assets. It's still likely that they kept their homes because they met in their homes. But they took from out of their abundance, and they made sure that those who were around them that had less had more than enough. This would have been a message that preached louder than words. The society around would have looked wondering, who who are these Christians, these ones who follow after this one who was crucified? They take care of one another. They, They reach out to others who have needs and they take care of those less fortunate than themselves. They sacrifice their own wants and sometimes even their own needs to ensure that everyone had enough. And it says that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Hmm. Can you imagine what it would be like if the church was in that place again? Where the church enjoyed the favor of all of the people. Where people were uh, amazed at the things that the apostles were doing. That the church was looked at as a beacon of hope and goodness in the world. Because I'm not sure that's where we live right now. Often, um, and maybe it's just some of the friends that I have on Facebook, I have a lot of atheist friends on Facebook, but often the things that they post are the, the really stupid things that we as Christians do. The stupid things that we say, the mean and hurtful things that we have done in the name of Jesus. And in their eyes, the church is something that the world should be rid of. If we could just get rid of religion, if we could do away with all of the harm that has been done in the name of God, or Jesus in our case. The the world doesn't necessarily look at the church as this beacon of hope, as this great thing to be clamoring your way into. The way that it was in the early days where they enjoyed the favor of all the people. People looked at what was going on and were like, man, they're they're doing something right over there. They're caring for people. There's, There's this obvious love. And the Lord added to their number daily. Daily. That means every day someone else became a follower of Jesus and a part of that fledgling community. Because of the love, because of the care, because people were reaching out. I wonder why it's not like that anymore. 
I wonder why the church doesn't enjoy that same favor. Perhaps it's because uh, we, we haven't been quick to love. We've been quicker to judge. Or perhaps it's because the world is just falling farther and farther away from the standard that Jesus set for us. Everyone is looking out for their own needs. Everybody is looking out for themselves. And this idea of caring for one another doesn't necessarily fall into the church as much as it possibly could. Have you ever wondered why we don't see this happening in our day and age? Maybe it's happening in other parts of the world. There are areas of our globe where the church is flourishing and thriving, where people are coming to it in droves, where the Lord truly is adding to their number daily those who are being saved. But I don't see it happening in my backyard. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why I think it might not be happening. First, I think we've blamed the culture. We've said that the people just aren't interested in coming to church anymore. And it's true. In some respects, Sunday morning, this is the worst time for us to do this. Did you know that? This is the worst time for, like, most people are still sleeping in. Maybe they're doing their chores today. I saw, as I was driving by my gym, I saw people in the gym at 8.30 this morning. Like, it's the day off. It's a day of rest. It's a day to kind of get caught up. 10.30 on a Sunday morning is not a great time. And so my neighbors, I know my neighbors are still napping right now. They're not all that interested in church. And we've, we've blamed the culture on the reason why we haven't experienced that same sort of favor, that same sort of growth. We've said, well, they're not really all that interested. If they were interested, they would come. They would show up. It's a true story. They may not be interested. But if you thought we lived in a Christian nation, I hate to burst your bubble this morning, but we'd live in a decidedly post-Christian world. Canada is a post-Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. We are not a nation of followers of Jesus. There are followers of Jesus who make this nation home, but this nation is not governed under the laws of the kingdom of God. The church is on the outer edges now. And we can blame the culture all we want. We can say that it sucks that that's what it is, but it is what it is. People aren't exactly beating, door, beating down the doors of the church trying to get in. And so we blame the culture for that. We blame the world around us that it's like, ah, it's just, it's going to hell in a handbasket and we don't know what to do with it. And so we think, well, it's just because they've chosen. They've decided they don't want anything to do with Jesus. And now we're kind of on the outside looking in. The church used to be the center of activity in a community. It used to be that like when a pastor would walk into a room, he was like, uh, he was like one of the like, respected leaders in the community. The way some people might look up to a judge or to a doctor or maybe, maybe a lawyer, some lawyers. We have good lawyers here. <laughs> But people who had, who had devoted their lives to serving others were seen as people worthy of respect. Now they're seen as news fodder for when they fall or when they, when they make a mess of stuff or they embezzle money. And that's the only time you hear about what's going on in the church. And so we've been relegated to the outer edges. And if you think specifically about this particular location, this particular church, it's easy for us to blame the fact that we thought there was going to be a neighborhood around us when we built this thing back in the 70s. We were told that this was going to be a whole bunch of residential stuff. So when they built here, they were like ahead of the game. We were going to be and now we have a storage unit and we have the small golf course right over there. And we do have some neighbors right over here in some really nice houses. But it does kind of suck that you need a car to get here. You can't walk here. There's no sidewalks. There's no bus route. We're limited to who can make it in here for a Sunday morning service. These are legitimate barriers to our effectiveness as a community. They're legitimate barriers. We will not likely have somebody just stumble in here because they happen to walk by and hear us singing. And so we can blame our location. We can blame the fact that where we are out on the fridges. You can blame the fact that culture has decided they don't want anything to do with us anymore. It's a true story. We live in a post-Christian world. But we still live in a world that is incredibly interested in spiritual things. And we are definitely living in a world that is drawn to love. I, I read a, somebody had posted a picture this morning that said, I don't know why love became so elusive, 
But I know one thing. No one has it. And it was Beyonce that said that. Some of the people who are speaking to our culture are saying that nobody has found what true love is. They're craving for it, though. They're starving for it. And church might seem like an outdated thing to them because they don't recognize that it's a place where they might actually find what they're looking for. Perhaps they've never seen the church in action. Perhaps they've never run into somebody that they knew was a Christian who showed them the love of Jesus in really practical ways. Maybe they've never seen the church reach out into the world to bring hope or relief or joy or help. So they see the church as unnecessary. It's actually the opposite of favor. The opposite of favor, in my mind, isn't, isn't antagonism. It's indifference. And whatever. They have no use for the church. And we might make excuses blaming the state of the world. Why the Lord is not adding to our number daily those who are being saved. But I think our excuses are missing the point. I think the fact that we live in a post-Christian world, I think the fact that our location isn't ideal for us to be able to reach our neighborhood doesn't really matter. Because what if, it's a big what if, what if the point isn't to get people into church? What if the point isn't to fill this building on a Sunday morning? What if the point isn't to have more people here this or next Sunday than this Sunday? What if the point instead is to get us out there? Not about getting people in here, but getting us out there. I mentioned a book last week, and I posted a a link to it on our Facebook page. I'd I'd encourage anybody who who can read (laughs) to read this. Uh, I was going to say anybody who enjoys reading, but you don't even need to enjoy reading. This, This book is a very small book. It's a short book, uh, and it's chock full of some really great stuff. Uh, It's put out by a missions organization, and so part of it is sharing that particular organization's vision for the way they run things. Uh, But it also has a lot of really great stuff about uh, our part in fulfilling the Great Commission, the idea of us kind of getting out there and just being Jesus with skin on in the neighborhoods around us. It's still free on Amazon Kindle. If you want to download it, you can get a free e-reader on your computer as well. But let me read you just a a brief part that essentially summarizes the thrust of the book in case you don't end up reading the whole thing. He writes, For the better part of two centuries, Western evangelicalism has championed the model of proclamation and invitation by a religious professional. If you're wondering, that's me. <laughs> Typically, unbelievers have been invited to venture onto Christian turf, i.e., our church building, once or twice a year, Christmas, Easter, or Bring a Friend Day. They listen to a full time religious professional proclaim a message, and then they're invited to accept it. That's what's been going on for the better part of two centuries. The more stout-hearted among us will sometimes take that message to the streets and proclaim it with a tract or some kind of gospel-based performance. How many of you remember human videos? But the approach is essentially the same. It's either proclaiming the truth from the safety of our world or making a brief foray into their world to give them a message that to them seems out of sync with the rest of their life. So we either try to get them in here, give them a message, or we jump out in there for a couple of seconds, say, Jesus is Lord, and then run back into our church. While those approaches have certainly yielded some results, I would suggest that they are increasingly ineffective and inaccessible to the majority of lost people today. I am ineffective. There's a better way than proclaiming truth from our world. It's living and proclaiming the truth in their world. One way is invitational. The better way is incarnational. One way focuses on proclamation by a religious professional. The better way calls for incarnation by believers of all professions. We are all called to fulfill the Great Commission. And to do that, we need to get out of here. We need to not be gathered in this place. 
You may be wondering what I mean by the Great Commission. And it's a title that's often given to the final words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. They're recorded for us in Matthew 28. These are sort of the famous last words of Jesus before he ascends into heaven. He says to his disciples that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All authority is given to Jesus. And so Jesus says, go. Go and make disciples. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the call of every disciple of Jesus. Everyone who calls himself a Christian. Because it follows that someone helped you become a disciple. You probably have somebody in your mind, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was your parents. There was somebody who introduced you to this idea of Jesus. There was somebody who introduced you to this faith walk, this idea that there was more to life than just what you were going through. And you came to understand that Jesus was real, that Jesus was Lord, and that you chose to follow him. And then maybe the same person, but somebody else came along and helped teach you about what that meant. Well, what does it mean to love Jesus? What does it mean? How do you understand? And so they showed you what the Bible had to say about Jesus. And maybe they got you a Bible of your own that you spent time reading and they taught you what it means to pray and they taught you what it means to be in fellowship with other believers. Somebody helped you become a disciple. Somebody discipled you. Now they maybe did a really great job or maybe there was lots of things you had to figure out on your own. But somebody helped you, make a, helped you become a disciple. So in order for this thing to keep going on, we as disciples need to make other disciples. If all of us decided today that we were just like, we're done telling people about Jesus. Do you know how long it would take for this church to be dead? In truth, it already has. If we decided today we're not telling anybody else about Jesus, I don't want to pastor this church. If we've decided that we don't want the world to know that there is more to life, that there is hope, that there is joy, that there is peace, then this church is already dead. But let's give it, conservatively, one generation. One generation from now, we cease to exist. But, on the flip side, I read this really interesting infographic. I'm going to get the the stats not totally correct, but basically, if one evangelist every day for... Uh, well, every day for as long as it takes, could get a thousand people saved. A thousand people saved every day, one evangelist. Do you know how long it would take that evangelist to reach the entire world? Over 15,000 years. Now, if each one of you, each Christian that is currently alive right now, discipled one, and then that one discipled one other, do you know how long it would take for the entire world to hear about Jesus? 37 years. Our lifetime, everybody could be a disciple. I know that that's really simple math, and there's a lot of other stuff that goes into that. But the power of multiplication, if we think that bringing people to here so that they can hear me preach a message, you've got to pick and choose which one I'm preaching, because one message might really be good for a non-believer to hear, and the next one might just be like, they're not going to get anything out of that message. I am not all that effective. Because I don't know what's going on in your friend's life. I don't know what's going on in your family member's life. And the problem is we've taken the call of discipleship. We've taken it away from each disciple and we've put it in the hands of professionals. (laughs) And I'm a professional. That's a scary thought. (laughs) We've put it in the hands of people who have the gift of evangelism and said that, well, we'll let them do it. We've, We've given money to missionaries and said, okay, we'll let them go and reach the world. And I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. We need evangelists. We need missionaries. We need people who are going to go share in places that we won't be able to reach and we need to help them get to where they're going. But we've sometimes thought that by doing those things, we're fulfilling the Great Commission. You're not. You're a part in it, yes, but you're not necessarily fulfilling the Great Commission. When we bring our friends to church, and don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing to bring your friends to church, but if we've expected a paid professional to get in front of them to fulfill the Great Commission for us, he's going to be grossly ineffective in making disciples. 
I find it strange that Jesus called us to make disciples and we have churches full of people who've never had the joy of leading somebody to Jesus, had somebody help them discover Jesus, never mind walking with them and teaching them what it means to follow him. Does that not seem a little odd that if the last words of Jesus were, go and make disciples, there are many of us who've never made a disciple? Francis Chan has this really great illustration about uh, telling his daughter to go clean her room. He says, when I say like, hey, Rach, go clean your room, she doesn't come back two hours later and say, I memorized what you told me. You said, Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back and say, you know, a few of my friends and I, we're going to get together. We're going to have a study about what it might look like if I were to clean my room. <laughs> we're, we're just going to really dig deep. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look into the Greek and figure out what it would mean. Theos, don, my room. She says, no, she doesn't do that. If I say go clean the room, she goes and cleans the room. If Jesus tells us, go and make disciples, how do, we, how do we forget to go and make disciples? How do we decide that it wasn't our responsibility? See, the church exists to help people live like and love like Jesus. And we really only have one job. It's to make Jesus known. It's to help people see Jesus more clearly. It's why we worship. It's why we do the preaching. It's why we teach. It's why we gather in this place. But it doesn't just happen in the safety of these four walls. If it does, we're missing the point. If we think that we have to get people to come to church to hear a message, to give their hearts to Jesus, if we can just get them here, and then they'll hear the pastor, and he'll lead them to Jesus, we are seriously diminishing the opportunities for those who don't know Jesus. Because even if you all were successful, that would mean next Sunday there would be 350, 400 people here. Am I going to be able to connect with 150 extra people? Is the message that I preach going to be exactly what each one of those 150 people need to hear? That Jesus is able to walk with them through the difficulty in their life? That Jesus is able to help them in their marriage struggles? That Jesus is able to help them with their financial worries? That Jesus is able to help them? That's four or five messages all at once. might sound a little harsh, but it's not my job to get your friends saved. It's not my job to leave your friends and family to Jesus. Don't get me wrong. If I have the opportunity to share my faith with one of your friends or one of your family members, I'll jump at it. I'd love to lead every one of your friends and family members to Jesus, but it's not possible. It's just a complete impossibility. I'll take whatever opportunity I get, but if you're counting on them coming to church to meet Jesus, you might be waiting a really long time. Because like we said, people aren't beating down the doors to get in here. They don't see it as relevant. But they see you as relevant. There's a reason why you are in their life. Whether it's because you're family or friends, there's something about the fact that you can speak into their lives. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians. He says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. He gave them to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son and God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Uh, My role as a pastor is to help disciple each one of you and try and figure it out myself, but... My role is to equip us, all of us, to reach the world. It's not my job to get everybody saved. It's my job to equip us. Now, I'm still a disciple. Just because my job is to equip doesn't mean I'm excused from fulfilling the Great Commission. I still have friends and family members that you don't know that I get to be the light of Jesus to. So I'm not off the hook in this message either. I'm called to help, though. I'm called to help you. I'm called to help your friends. And that doesn't necessarily mean to help get your friends here on a Sunday morning. Because can I let you in on a secret? Jesus moves outside of this building. 
right now, even those people who are running in the gym, Jesus is able to work in their hearts. Even your next door neighbor who's still napping, Jesus is able to work in their hearts. Jesus moves in your living room. He moves at your kitchen table. He moves when you have a bonfire in your backyard, when you sit out by the lake, when you hang out on your front lawn with your next door neighbors as you spend time with them. Jesus moves in those situations. We need to blow up this idea that people need to come to church to find Jesus. Because I've often found Jesus outside the church more quickly than I found him inside the church. Wherever there's somebody hurting, it was Mr. Rogers. It's Mr. Rogers that said, when you see all the trouble in the world, look for the helpers. There's always people who rush towards that. I often see that's where Jesus is. Jesus is where there's trouble. Jesus is in there to bring help and to bring healing and wholeness. A church needs to get out of the building and partner with what Jesus is already doing in the community and neighborhood. I love Michael Gunger. Um, on his Beautiful Things album, he has a song called Cannot Keep You. Oh, we cannot keep you. And these are a couple of the lyrics. It says, they could not keep you in a tent. They could not keep you in a temple. Or in any other of their idols to see and understand. We cannot keep you in a church. We cannot keep you in a Bible. Or it's just another idol to box you in. They could not keep you in their box, and we cannot keep you in ours either, for you are so much greater. Who is like the Lord, the maker of the heavens, who dwells with the poor as he lifts them from the ashes, and he makes them sit with princes? Who is like the Lord? We've tried to keep you in our tents. We've tried to keep you in our temples. We've worshipped other idols, and we want all that to end. We will find you in the streets And we will find you in the prisons, even in our Bibles and churches. For who is like the Lord, the maker of the heavens, lover of my soul? He takes me from the ashes. He heals up my blindness. Who is like the Lord? See, God is already out there. God is already at work in the lives of people that you love and care about. What would it look like for you to partner with the Spirit of God and fulfill the Great Commission? We're called to reach out. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are called to make other disciples. And it's not as scary or complicated as you might think. You see, some of the tools that we have used in the past, we've wondered if you have the gift of evangelism. Um, I came to faith at at a... at a youth convention or rally in the typical way that the, uh, we used to do ministry, where there was a powerful salvation message, and, and I, I came to faith, I bent my knee. The first person I led to Jesus happened on a teeter-totter in a park as we were talking about stuff that was going on in his life. So we were talking about the pain he was going through with some of the stuff that was happening in his family. That was the first person I led to Jesus. A teeter-totter in a park. Second person I led to Jesus, we were driving home from a fairly rowdy party. And he began asking why I didn't smoke any of the drugs that were happening in the party. And I said, you know what, I've I found something better and I don't, I don't need that. And he started asking questions and I started talking about Jesus. And I talked about the Holy Spirit and what God had done in my heart. And he said, do you think God could do that with me? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> I was a pretty new Christian. I didn't know for sure if I was special. (laughs) Neither one of those guys set foot in a church for another two or three years. One of them now, I have to check in on where the other one is. One of them, though, has three kids. He's an elder in his church. He never stopped following Jesus from that moment on. It wasn't complicated. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a brand new Christian. But I do know that when I see people hurting, I can offer to pray for them. I can help out in any way that seems like a beneficial way to help out. Making a meal, mowing their lawn. I don't think we need to stand on a street corner. I don't think we need to hand people tracts. I don't think we need to go down any of those paths. I don't think you need to have the gift of evangelism. I 
think you need to have a gift of love. If you give a rip about people, Jesus will use you. But if you show them the light that's inside of you, the reason why Jesus means something to you, yeah, it means sharing your story with them. But we live in a a nation that's okay with your story. Because your truth is your truth. And if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they'll tell you soon enough. I have yet to meet somebody, though, who's like, eh, I'm not interested. They'll listen to my story, and then they'll say, like, oh, that's cool. And that's the end of the conversation. But I've never had anybody shut me down when I've tried to share my story. And when people find how Jesus could meet the need that they have, when they see Jesus for who he is, he becomes pretty irresistible. And it ceases to be about you at that point. It ceases to be about whether you shared it just right, whether you said the right words. You helped introduce them. Your friend and Jesus. And once they choose to follow him, you just keep that conversation going. That's when you invite them to church. That's when you invite them to be a part of your life group. That's when you say like, hey, why don't you keep this conversation going? It's sharing your life and your journey with one another. That's what making a disciple is. It's not a class. It's not, it's doing life together and helping other people experience Jesus. There aren't any check marks. There's no things that you have to fill out. It's loving other people towards Jesus. We shared a message a few months back, I think, where some of your friends might be a three on a scale of one to ten. Ten being, I'm ready to love Jesus with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one being like, get lost. The church and Jesus are the worst thing that ever happened to the world. Your friends might be a three. Your job isn't necessarily to drag them to ten next Sunday. What about moving them to four or five by showing them the love and sharing your story? Well, I want you to think for a couple of moments right now, who's in your life that doesn't know Jesus right now? And you might have already noticed some strange coincidences about the times and places or conversations that you find yourself in. One of the things I love doing when it comes to spending time with people is recognizing the way Jesus comes up. And maybe it's because I'm a pastor, but Jesus comes up in conversation in ways that I'm just like, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, like it's almost too easy to like... People are so hungry to know who God is. So you may be noticing that there's like, hey, that this person's been around a little bit more often, and I wonder why that's going on. Maybe you share something in common. Maybe you, you ride the same bike trails or you go to the same gym. and For some reason, they've been brought into your life and you've been brought into theirs. What if that's not by chance? And I'm not saying you have to go and you get out the four spiritual laws and you... You preach at them. But what if there's a reason why your paths have crossed for such a time as this? What if you're the clearest representation of Jesus that that person is going to see at this moment in history? How would you act? What would you do? What would you say if you were the clearest representation of Jesus in that person's life at this moment in history? What I want you to do this morning is I want you to take one of those connection cards. If you have it in front of you, if you, have it, uh, if you don't have one right in front of you, there's extra ones laying around. But grab a connection card. I'm going to pray, and I want you to write one name on that card. Um, if you feel comfortable with me knowing who you are and who is on your list, I'd like you to fill out your information too. But I'm going to pray and ask you to place one name that you have on your heart and your mind. Write it down. And I'll tell you what we're going to do with it in a second. God, I thank you that you give us the joy of helping other people discover Jesus. That you have, you've revealed your goodness and your grace and your love to us. And it has made the world of difference in the way we see people, the way we see the world around us. And it has um, given us such peace when we think about what eternity is going to hold for us, that there's, there's so much that you've already given to us. We want to share that with those around us who don't know the same peace and hope and love and joy. And we recognize that there are people who are just not interested, who are, they're not in a spot where they're ready to hear it. So just help us to figure out ways to love them and to reveal your goodness, not to treat them like some sort of project, but just to be you with skin on when we're near them. But there are people who are in our lives that you seem to have brought by for, for this season. And it's, 
It's a name that's being dropped into every heart and every mind right now. I just pray that you'd help us to write that name down and then just begin to pray, to ask you to reveal your love and your grace and your hope to their heart and that you would also help us as individuals to know how we might partner with you in revealing you in greater ways. Would you help us to that end as we write this name down now in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, now I want you to write down that person's name and maybe the relationship that you have to that person. So if it's your dad, your mom, your grandkids, uh, classmate, coworker. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to put them either in the baskets at the back there or in the offering plates. And this week, I will pray personally for every name on those cards. And next week, we don't have staff meeting this week, but next week when the four of us that get together as staff, we will pray again for the names on those lists. And we'll pray for you if your name's on there, that you would have the courage, the, the sensitivity to the Spirit to know how you could reveal the love of Jesus to those people. We're going on a leadership team retreat tonight, so maybe we'll take them along with us and have the leadership pray for them as well. Because we've all been called to reach out. We've all been called to get connected. We've been called to be formed. And we've been called to reach out. We are called to be disciples who make other disciples. These are the markers of a healthy community. I believe they're the markers of a healthy church or a life group. And even as a healthy follower of Jesus, that there is some way that we are connected with the body of Christ around us. That we are being formed into the image of Jesus, becoming more like him as we grow together. And that we are sharing that with other people. That we are reaching out. And this is what it's going to mean for us as grace to follow Jesus today. The call you're going to hear over and over again is for us to get connected, be formed, and to reach out. Because I believe it's the call of God that we would be his disciples. People who know that they're loved by God and follow him because of that great love. And who can't keep that to themselves. Who share that love with those around him. That they too might become his disciples and make more disciples. Amen? Amen. So as you're filling those out, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, for the challenge that it's been to my own heart. I pray that uh, we wouldn't leave this place and just kind of forget about it, but that we would have it churning in our own heart and minds throughout the week as we think about what it means for us to reach out as disciples of yours. And not that we do it out of guilt, not that we do it because pastor said we have to do it, but that there is something stirred inside of us that we love to share your goodness with people who are in need of that love and grace and peace and hope. And so God, would you help us, help us to live the way that you would call us to this week, to be faithful to all that you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me leave you with this benediction. Life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may God's blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Thanks be to God. Amen.